Hello and welcome to Database Management Systems. I'm Javita Christie and I'm going to start this lecture series on database management systems with a quote, a quotation from a well-known British computer scientist, Maurice Wilkes, who was the one who designed EDSAC, which was one of the earliest stored program computers. The quote goes something like this. I would like to see computer science teaching set deliberately in a historical framework. Students need to understand how the present situation has come about, what was tried, what worked and what did not, and how improvements in hardware made progress possible. The absence of this element in their teaching causes people to approach every problem from first principles. They are apt to propose solutions that have been found wanting in the past. Instead of standing on the shoulders of their precursors, they try to do it alone. What this quotation right here says is um, that computer science should be taught in an historical framework. It should not be taught in, in just the modern things. You should also study the history behind what uh, behind everything that is existing today. The reason behind that is many a time we find ourselves um, providing solutions that have already been found or that were, that are no longer required. And the reason why that happens is because we do not know what the history is, that these things have already been found in the past, have been discovered or invented. So that is why Maurice Wilkes points out that uh, instead of standing on the shoulders of their precursors, they try to do it alone. So what we are supposed to do is we're supposed to make better solutions and not alternative solutions. So which is why I'd like to begin this lecture series with a little bit of history about how DBMS came about and how it got improved. And from there, we'll take it up and progress in our lecture series. Now, in the beginning, before everything started, there was a primitive kind of database management system, which is called the file system. And that comes with your computer. Whether your computer is having a Unix file system or NTFS, which is a new technology file system or Macintosh file system, depending on the, uh, the operating system that you use, it's the same basic idea. And these file systems are being used even today in your computers. So that itself is a database management system, but it cannot be very efficient when it comes to uh, dealing with applications where you need proper database management systems. And, but the great thing about file system is that it is invisible. You do not have to purchase it separately. And sometimes we are not even aware of its existence. And you don't even have to, you know, put an advertisement in the newspaper asking for a file system administrator with five plus years of experience because you don't really need that file system is pretty much easy to handle and you can handle it on your own. You don't really hire an assistant to organize the files in your computer. All you need to do is perhaps, you know, use a hard drive and back your file up, files up, you know, every day or two if, if your data is really very sensitive and important. That's all, right? But despite its unobtrusiveness, the file system that you use in a MacBook or Unix or Windows machine, it's capable of storing any data that may be represented in a digital form, right? So uh, let me give you an example. So this is what it looked like, you know, storing uh, email IDs of, uh, of people, creating a mailing list. Now, if you were working with, uh, say, a programming language like C language, you would have already studied how to read and write into a TXT file, which comes with the Windows system. So 
this is nothing new and this is what it would look like if you were just writing simple c language programs and all you were using to store data was this type of uh, a text file so what happens here in this type of a file you've created a mailing list you've created a list of emails to whom you want to send uh, uh, emails and now in this list the only problem is what happens i mean not the only problem one of the problems is what happens when you want to search for an email id wouldn't that be rather difficult because your file contains so many email IDs and you'd have to go through the entire list one by one in order to find a particular email ID that you are looking for and you might not even find it. And suppose you wanted to insert a new ID, then you'd create a program, as, uh, let's say you, you create a very small C language program and um, you're simply doing a read and write function, you know, that appends one email ID at the end of the file. So that works perfectly fine. But what happens when several users are trying to access your website for which you have written this program and for which you are storing data in your file? And when several users are accessing and two of them ask you to add them into the mailing list at the same time, then what happens? So depending on the file system that you have, two things can happen. Uh, sorry, rather three things can happen. Either both, both the email IDs are inserted without any problem, or there is one of the inserts which is lost, or it's possible that both the inserts get mixed up together and they get corrupted. So these are the things that can happen in a simple file system. Now imagine having this type of a file system and running an online payment system. So what happens then? Running an online payment system and if you open a sort of an internet bank, so if you are already an experienced programmer, you'll simply write a program and you will create two files. One is a checking.txt file and let's say another one is a savings.txt file. Both the files are storing balances. The checking stores um, balances of people's checking account and savings stores the balances of people's savings account. So you're running an internet bank. Now, a few days later, an unlucky combination of events occurs. Let's say that Joseph is transferring $10,000 from his savings to his checking account. Mary is simultaneously depositing $5 into her savings account. And one of your C language programs successfully writes the checking account balance of Joseph. So both of them are trying to do the, these things at the same time. So what happens now is your C language program successfully transfers 10,000 from Joseph's savings account to the checking account. So his new balance would be 11,000 right here. But what happens is before the, uh, before the file is actually written, Mary is accessing the savings.txt file. And at that time, Joseph's balance was $25,000 because Joseph and Mary both accessed the savings file together. So when Mary accesses this file, Joseph's balance is still $25,000, $25, which is why when Mary deposits the money, that is $5 into her savings account, it is visible here as $505, but Joseph's balance remains as it was. It 10,000 should have been deducted, but instead it remains $25,000. Now, where does that leave you as the owner of the internet uh, bank? It leaves you $10,000 poorer. Now, this is an issue called concurrency issue where two people are trying to access the same file at the same time. So to avoid this type of an issue, you might have to write, uh, you might have to study some 
concurrency control techniques and maybe you can modify your program accordingly and maybe you manage to do that. Now what? Suppose you are having a hardware failure or a software failure and your system stops functioning because you're running this out of your home and your system stops functioning, then what happens? Suppose now Joseph's uh, balance in the checkings account was already changed, but it, your system still had to uh, subtract money from the savings account. So again, this thing leaves you $10,000 poorer as, as it was before. So all these are different problems with uh, using simple file systems, which is why we have to use a database management system, which provides you with four important properties, which are atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And these are very famously known as the asset properties. What atomicity states is that transactions are either completed fully or not completed at all. Like in the case of Joseph, either the transaction completes fully, that means both the checking and savings account balances are updated or neither one of them is updated. That leaves your database in a consistent state, which is the second property consistency, which is uh, maintaining the correctness of the database and then you have isolation. Isolation uh, makes sure that when two transactions are happening at the same time, they should not affect each other. And if they are to affect each other, you'd not do them together, you'd do them one by one. And finally, durability. Durability means once your data is written, it should not be lost. So to to provide durability, you'd have to have very good backup systems or uh, not just backup systems, but uh, some mechanism to recover your data or to recover even the data that wasn't saved properly. So which is what a good DBMS shows. A DBMS also comes with indexing. Indexing basically helps you to access your data very quickly and searching becomes very much easier when you have index files. Now, uh, a DBMS uses index, which is a type of a data structure in order to store and represent its data. And that index is not just a single level index. It, it is a multi-level index. And think of this as having an index in a book. So instead of, uh, if you were looking for some, some topic, instead of having to go through the entire 2,000, 3,000 pages of your book, you just go to the index and find the topic. Some books even provide you alphabetical indices in the, in the end, and even that helps. You can just search for your topic and then look at the page number and go there. You do not have to go through all the 2,000 pages to find what you're looking for. So same thing is true with DBMS. It provides indexing, and sometimes it is a multi-level index. So first you are going to look in the outer index and then you decide which section you want to access using the outer index and then it points you to an inner index where you can again find out in which uh, block of data your um, in which data block your data is actually stored and so you get to access that data. So this is the the advantage of having a DBMS, which, which has asset properties and indexing. And nowadays, the most popular thing that is used is an RDBMS, which stands for Relational Database Management System. This comes with its own programming language, which is known as SQL or Structured Query Language, uh, for which I'm going to create uh, videos in this uh, lecture series later on. And SQL provides you a very, uh, very simple and, and concise and clean way of writing, uh, writing questions, writing queries, which are called, uh, which are basically things that you ask to your database management system, whether it is inserting data or viewing the data or updating or deleting the data. It, it's just a matter of 
two, three lines of code as compared to any programming language where you would be writing several lines of code. So this is the advantage of having DBMS. And thank you for watching. I'll be seeing you in the next video.